a mighty fortress is our God. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient Fortress is our God. 
6 starts off this way. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. And, he, and Psalm 46 ends with, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God is with us. Let's sing that together. Psalm of David. I will bless Yahweh at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in Yahweh. The humble will hear it and rejoice. O magnify Yahweh with me, and let us exalt his name together. I inquired of Yahweh, and he answered me, and delivered me from all that I dread. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be humiliated. This poor man called out, and Yahweh heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him, and rescues them. O taste and see that Yahweh is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear Yahweh, you his saints, for there is no want to those who fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who inquire of Yahweh shall not be in want of any good thing. That passage that uh, Austin just read says, how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let us take refuge in him today and just sing, he will hold me fast. When I 
Christ, fear my faith fail. Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would fail. He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often hold he must hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so he will hold Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at
Lord, we long to be with you, and we are thankful that we can start that eternal life now with you in your presence. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here in your presence with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, we pray for those around the world who are meeting, uh, often in secret, often under threat of persecution. Uh, bless them today. Give them uh, grace in their worship today as well. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Um, quick announcement. Um, some of you may already know, but uh, Cindy Brown's father passed away this past week. So Nick and Cindy are out of town. They are in Texas. They're with family. So be, please be in prayer for them. Uh, but we are grateful to have um, Mark Gaylor here to, to bring us the message this morning. Mark is a student at Mid-America uh, 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 Seminary. And uh, he's working on his associate's degree in divinity. So... Um, He's been a believer for about six years. He's currently the youth director at Zion Baptist Church in Brownsville, Tennessee. And uh, for those of you who listen to podcasts, he actually has a theology podcast called the Middle Cross Podcast. Did I get that right? Okay. Uh, he's been married for three years. Unfortunately, his uh, wife is unable to be here this morning. But uh, um, I know he's going to bring a great message from the Word this morning. So, Mark, come on. While you're coming, um, let's see Corey in the back. So if you have young children up uh, for children's uh, church this morning, you are now free to dismiss them, and uh, they can go to the back and meet Miss Corey and go from there. Thank you. Set this to the side here. Can you all hear me? Is this on? You all forgive me. I... Uh, I've never had to wear one of these before. Uh, I feel like the Terminator <laughs> up here. Uh, but no, it's an honor to be with you here uh, this morning. Um, I love your pastor. He is, uh, it's, a, it's a rare thing. I, I've had the opportunity to listen to a few of uh, his sermons on Sunday morning here. And, and uh, don't take it for granted, church. It's a rare thing, uh, oddly enough today, to have a pastor that truly preaches the word of God and who preaches it as, as well and as eloquently as your pastor does. And I'm incredibly thankful for uh, Nick. He's helped me uh, navigate the waters of being new in ministry and, and uh, his counsel has helped me many times. And, and I'm just, I'm very thankful for him. I love him and, I, and just from meeting just a few of you here uh, this morning, I love you, I love your church. And uh, I'm looking forward to meeting the rest of you afterwards. I hear y'all eat after service. And if there's something that me and Nick really see eye to eye on is that we love to eat. And uh, so, no, I'm looking forward to that um, this morning. Well, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 8 and verse 56. But don't get too comfortable there. We're going to be using this verse in John as kind of the diving board to launch us into the deep waters of the Old Testament more specifically, Genesis chapter 22. And um, if you want to put a finger there in Genesis and then flip over and meet with me here in, in John, that would probably be advantageous to you. But there's an odd statement that is found in the book of John, and it's not said by any disciple or by a side character. It's said by Jesus himself. And, and it, to me, it's one of the more odd things that Jesus says. And Jesus out of context, says some strange things that may be difficult for us to come to grips with. But this one just kind of seems to come out of nowhere. And, and just to give you a little bit of context for this, he's speaking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, and they're kind of cornering him and, and questioning him. And he says something to me is kind of odd, and, and maybe you feel the same way as well. He says this, your father, Abraham, rejoiced to see my day. And, and get this, he said, and he saw it and was glad. I mean, what, what an odd statement that Jesus would say about a person that lived hundreds and hundreds of years before he ever even showed up. I mean, what, what is he trying to say about Abraham? Can he say that Abraham can look into the future and, and see that it would be Jesus' day? I don't think that's the case. I think that Abraham himself had an opportunity to see a passionate portrait 
of what it would look like when the only Son of God would come and be sacrificed for his people. And I feel as though the answer to this question that I pose to you of what did Jesus mean when he was talking about Abraham can be found in Genesis chapter 22. So if you would please turn with me to Genesis chapter 22, and that's where we will, we will be spending the remainder of our time together. Uh, in my office in Brownsville, Tennessee, I have uh, on, on my desk a small Polaroid photo um, of me and my wife, and it was taken before she was my wife, before we started even dating. And, and I say it's our first date, but I hesitate to say it's our first date uh, because her friends were there, my friends were there, my parents were there, my brother was there, his wife was there, and his kid was there. So I hesitate to call it a date, but I asked my parents, hey, can I invite this girl that I've been talking to, Hannah? And she said, oh, yeah, sure. And so we go down to the Peabody Hotel, and, and uh, we're just all kind of hanging out there, and my brother and his wife are getting pictures together. They're newlyweds at this point, and, and uh, my parents are taking pictures together. They've been married for over 30 years, and, and um, me and Hannah are just kind of standing in the corner. And it's kind of awkward, and my mom is uh, half Brazilian, so this is why I say this in an accent. She says, oh, you take picture, please, get together. And I can say that because she's my mom, all right? I can make fun of her like that. Uh, but so me and Hannah, we kind of get together in front of this fountain, and, and it's super awkward because I'm a really awkward person, and my wife is an extremely awkward person. And so we're kind of, you know, like, and it's really weird, right? just to kind of give you a a glimpse, but my, my mom takes it, and she's, and it was back in 2016 when the, the Polaroid cameras were making a comeback, and, and so I take it, and I do this, and a lot of y'all don't even know what this is, but I'm doing this with a picture, and, and, it's, uh, and it's developing, and that picture today it sits on my desk, and I never get tired of looking at that picture, because as awkward as it is, and as funny as it is, man, that's my girl, and I love to see her face, and, I, and every time I look at that picture, I think, Man, Mark, if you'd only knew what the Lord had in store for you and that girl. And I, and I love looking at that picture, and I never get tired of looking at it. But before I got to see the glimpse of my wife's face, it had to develop first. And Genesis chapter 22 is a picture of Christ, but it's still developing. And I think every Christian, when they see a picture of Christ in the Scriptures, should take time and relish it and really enjoy it. Because as Christians... Our lives should be what is called in theology Christocentric. It means Christ-centered. So when we see a picture of our Christ and the one that we love and the one that we long to be with, we should really take time and just sit and enjoy it as a, fa- as a husband looks at a picture of his wife and just sits and, en- and enjoys the picture of his wife. Let's begin in Genesis chapter 22 and, and verses 1 through 2, and you'll, you'll forgive me again as well. This is my first time ever preaching on an iPad. My, my wife got it for me. I'm still trying to figure this out. But <laughs> uh, Genesis chapter 22 and verses 1 through 2, and it says this. Now what happened after these things, that God did test Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, now take your son, your only one, whom you love, Isaac, and take him to the Mount of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. Whoa. It's a heavy statement given by the Lord. Oftentimes in Scripture, when Christians read through the Bible, uh, they decide they're going to read through the Bible, they often start in Genesis. And when we get to this point, a lot of us as Christians like to skip over this one. We don't really want to have to think this way. We really don't want to have to take too much time on what in the world is this? We're afraid of what kind of questions it's going to bring up. Mark, isn't this wrong? Isn't what the Lord asks of one of his most dedicated servants, isn't this wrong? That he would ask him for child sacrifice? Mark, what is this bizarre request doing here. And we like to skip over it because we're afraid of the questions that it's going to bring up. And this is honestly the section of scripture that many atheists like to bring up. They call him a a divine child abuser. But as I mentioned before, these types of scriptures, we shouldn't run away from church. These are the types of scriptures that deserve our most careful 
study. So he says, now after these things, God tested Abraham. What, what, what things? Well, you, we all know the story of Abraham and, and his wife, Sarah. Well, they were, the Lord came and he spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 and, and verse 5. And he said, look to the heavens, Abraham, count the stars. Can you count them? Even so shall your descendants be. He's given a promise. And well, Abraham and, and Sarah, well, they hear this bizarre request because they're older now and and they say they laugh they say it's impossible and well many years go by after that promise is made the promise of the stars many years go by and sarah says well i'm kind of getting impatient um abraham how about we do this you take my maidservant uh hagar and you take and have a son with her and she and she did have a son ishmael the lord comes back and he says now that's not the son that i had planned And he says in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 14, is there anything impossible with the Lord? Sarah will have a son. And she did. And in chapter 21, she has a son. And it's a miracle child. And it's the first glimpse. Now, we think about it as a picture that's being developing. It's the first glimpse, one of the first details we see, that Isaac himself is what we call in theology a type of Christ. It's the study of typology. He is a figurement of what Christ will be. We see that his birth is prophesied before he's ever born. His name is given to him. Jesus, in the same way, was prophesied before he was ever born. His name was given to him before he was born. It's a picture of Christ. And after all these things, after all these hardships, after all these difficulties, after promise here and and no fulfillment, and then finally the fulfillment, and he's being blessed, and all these piles of piles of blessings that are on Abraham, the Lord calls out to him, and he says, Here am I, Lord. What's next? Here I am. Behold me is the literal phraseology there in the Hebrew is, behold me, Lord, what's next? I'm ready for whatever you have. He's come to him before, right? The Lord has come to Abraham before. And and in chapter, and in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, the the first time he came unto him, he said, don't fear, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. So at this point, he's probably thinking, oh, the Lord's coming back to me, and he's, and he's, and he's calling out my name, and oh, I'm ready, Lord. What's next? Uh, is Isaac, is he going to have a wife? Is, is he going to be, are the descendants going to start to come like you promised? But nothing could prepare him for what the Lord said. And I love this. The Lord calls to him, and he says in the Hebrew, literally, hineni. Here I am. Behold me, Lord. He says this in verse 2. Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And I want you to notice this. The, 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 the threefold way in which the Lord addresses Abraham. Take your son, your only one. Oh yeah, and just in case you forgot Abraham, the child you love. And, and just in case all that wasn't clear, Isaac. And you think, Mark, why does he address him in this threefold manner? And it's because the Lord has been preparing him for this moment all along. If we look, and, and you by no means have to turn to these references. I, I just say them for you and read them for you out loud. But if we look in uh, Genesis chapter 12, I believe it is, and, and when the Lord asks him to leave his house, he asks him again in this threefold manner. Notice this. He says, now the Lord said to Abram, before his name is Abraham, Go from your country and your relative's house and your father's house. He asks him in this threefold way because he is preparing him for what is to come. He tells him to go to the land of Moriah and he is preparing him for his Moriah moment, as it were. He says, take your son, your only son. The Lord has been building his faith. You know, oftentimes in our lives, when we encounter hardships or struggles and we see another Christian that has gone through tragedy in their life, whether it be the loss of a loved one, sickness, whatever it is, we think, I don't think I could have the strength that they have. Or when we read here in Genesis, when the Lord literally asked him to take his own son and kill him, I don't think I could have the strength to just follow God like this. We, 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 we miss the prior preparation. The Lord has prepared Abraham for these moments. This doesn't just come out of the blue. He's prepared him for it. 
Jesus also prepares us for difficulties we not might encounter, will encounter. John 6, 33 says, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but he says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. And continuing in verse 2, he says, now go forth to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. And more and more the picture begins to develop. Friends, family, this is not some random hill that the Lord has chosen. This is a specific hill that the Lord has chosen. This is Mount Moriah. And why is this a specific hill? It's because a father would have to take his son up this hill, but it's not Abraham and Isaac. 2,000 years later, the Lord would climb the same hill and he would be crucified on the same place. It's a beautiful picture of what is to come. He doesn't just choose some random hill. He says to go to this particular mountain, and then he says to offer him up. And this offer him literally means to lift up. And the Lord Jesus said in John 12, 32, if I be lifted up from earth, I will draw all men to me. As this picture begins to unfold, we see more and more of how Christ is sovereign and how he is in control. Verse 3, it says, So Abraham rose early, and he saddled his donkey, and he took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, and he split a burnt offering, and he rose and went to the place of which God told him. No audible response. Nothing. Now, me as a Bible student, and I'm sure you as a reader or student of the word, as your pastor told me on the phone this last week, he said they're students of the word, Mark, and I don't doubt that. I want paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs in between verse 2 and verse 3. I want argumentation. I want fighting with God because for me, that's my response. Argumentation, fighting with God. I, 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 want, I want the Job version of this, right? I want long, long chapters. I want this response, but notice we hear no response from Abraham. And keep in mind, this isn't the first time the Lord has spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Abraham before. In fact, way earlier in chapter 18, he speaks to Abraham and he says, Sodom and Gomorrah has sinned against me and I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth. They've had chance and chance and time and time again to repent, yet they don't. And what does Abraham say? Then he speaks up. He says, Lord, will you indeed wipe away the righteous with the wicked? Yet when it comes to his own son, he says nothing. And I'll be honest with you, friends, that drives me insane. (laughs) If I could just be honest with you, that drives me insane. Because I I want the new Mark version of the Bible. I want my response into it. But he doesn't say anything. This tells us of Abraham's theology. And I know you all are familiar with these terms, but I'll define it. Theology is the study of God. Theo is God, and ology is the study of. This tells us of his theology, and you think, Mark, how can Abraham have a theology? He doesn't even own a Bible. Abraham's theology consists of two things. God and his word. Two things, God and his word. He knows that the Lord has made a promise that is associated with his son Isaac. And he knows that if God says it, you can bank on it. It'll get done. You know, oftentimes in our lives, we, we struggle to find purpose. We struggle through life, one thing after another, and we are miserable. And, and we think, God, why are you doing this to me? A lot of the times, I hate to say it, the the reason for your depression, the reason for your anxiety, is because you don't know God in his word. God has much to tell you in his word. He has many promises for his chosen elect few. Yet you must read his word in order to reap the benefits of these promises. Or else, I don't know, I, I, I would be going through life 
freaking out, <laughs> scared to death, because I don't have God in his word, but Abraham has God in his word, and he commands him to do this thing, and, and, and he gets up, right, and it says uh, in verse 3, and he, and he saddled his donkey, and he took two young men with him, and notice this, he split wood for the burnt offering, and he rose up, and he went to the place which God had told him. Now, keep in mind, Abraham is a rich dude, he has got a lot of money. He's got servants. He's got camels. He's got donkeys. He's got all this. All he does is just snap his fingers. The job's done. Yet he gets up early. He splits the wood. He saddles his donkey. Why? If I'm just applying myself a little bit to this in the new Mark version that I was telling you about, when I, when I get anxious to have to do something, right, and that, that I know is going to be challenging, I like to keep myself busy. Before I got into ministry, I was doing what I loved, manual labor, right? And, 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 and that's kind of my turn-off switch when I'm in ministry and I'm having to sit and write papers and do that kind of stuff. I, I, uh, whenever I want to just, just decompress, I'll go out and do something with my hands. I like to work. That's what I imagine Abraham is doing here. A lot of commentators say, well, he, wrote, he rose up early because he was excited to do God's will. I don't think that's the case at all. <laughs> But he goes to the place which God tells him, and we've already established what this place is. Notice this, verse 4, and I love this. And if you don't love your word, I hope you have a new appreciation for it today. On the third day. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that great? I love that. He says, on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes, and he saw the place from the distance. I love that. On the third day. Mark, why is that so important? Notice this. The son and the father are walking together. Remember how we talked about this is a type of Christ. This is a picture of Christ. How long would Jesus' earthly ministry last? Three years. And the father and the son would walk together for three years. And we hear so often of the son saying, I seek to do the father's will. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. He says this over and over again. It's a beautiful picture, and and none of this is by mistake, friends, either. This is all according to God's sovereign plan. So they walk to this place, and archaeologists have calculated it about how far it would be, about 40 miles. 72 hours it would take him. And you know, in spite of, of Isaac's name literally meaning laughter, I highly doubt, friends, there was a lot of laughter going on while they walked. Because for three days, I would imagine that Abraham, I mean, for Abraham, Isaac was probably already dead in his mind. Three days they walk. Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from the distance. Now, later on, spoiler alert, Abraham would go on to name this place. And if I say it in the Hebrew, you won't recognize it, but if I say it in the Southern translation, you'll you'll recognize it. You already? You already? (laughs) In the Hebrew, it's Yehovah Hiri. In the Southern version, it's Jehovah Jireh, right? (laughs) But it means the Lord will provide. But in this moment, he's probably thinking, Lord, how am I supposed to do this? Or, Lord, provide another way but his faith seems to be carrying him. And in verse 5, it says this, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there. And we will worship and return to you. Now, notice what he doesn't say. We will worship and I will return to you. We will worship and we will return to you. Did he think he was going to somehow get out of it? I don't think so. Later on, Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, that's secondary, (laughs) would go on to say this about Abraham, his commentary on Abraham. He'd say in Hebrews 11, 19, and again, you don't have to turn there. He said that he considered that God is even able to raise men from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So Abraham, in a sense, believes that even if he slashes the throat of his son, burns him down and reduces him down to an ash heap, that even the Lord can rise him from that ash heap because of what? God and his word. 
he calls what he's about to do worship. I think that's kind of odd. I would imagine that if you were even go, go as far as to put down a dog or something, you wouldn't call that worship. But he calls this worship, and he knows what he's about to do. No one else knows, I don't think, but he knows what he's about to do. But for Abraham, worship was sacrifice. This wasn't an alien term to him. Worship consisted of sacrifice. And you think, Mark, well, that's, that's Old Testament. I mean, it doesn't really apply to us today. No, 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 I believe it does. Worship in our lives should be sacrifice. And I love it how David and the band sang, a mighty fortress is our God. It's truly what it is. But in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, and I'm sure you're familiar, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, to present your body a living sacrifice. Friends, if you hear nothing else, it's that every single day of your life should be put on the altar of sacrifice to Jesus Christ. And whatever that way that looks, whether it be your job, your family, your future, put it on the altar of sacrifice to the one you love most, which is Christ. Philippians 4.18 says, our life should be a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And you may ask, Mark, how do I do this? God and his word. Study God in his, in his word. And let's continue on, because we got a, as Jerry Reed says, we got a long way to go in a short time to get there, right? Verse 6, y'all are going to have that song stuck in your head for the rest of the day, I can guarantee it if you know it. <laughs> Verse 6 says this, Then Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he put it on his son Isaac. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and so the two of them walked together. Now, really quick, I want you to get the, 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 the flannel graph Sunday school picture of who you think Isaac is out of your mind. Uh, Isaac, by this point, a lot of historians believe is a grown man, 33 years old, if we're going to the, according to the type, right? Jesus 33, Isaac's 33. There's no real way to say that he was, in fact, 33. I just kind of like to think he was. <laughs> It'd be really cool, but we know he's a grown man. And to think that, that, that the father puts the wood on the son. Now, for obvious reasons, I didn't Google or research how much wood it takes to burn the carcass of a person. Obvious reasons, I might get put on a list or something like that. <laughs> but I'd imagine that it's a lot of wood. And so he's got to be a, a strong guy, right? But notice this. Let's go back to the picture of Jesus the father puts the wood on his son. Keep that in mind as we're going back and forth from Jesus to Isaac, to Jesus and his heavenly father, to Isaac and his physical father. He puts the wood on his back, and it says he took in his hand the fire. Now, when I was a kid, every time I would hear this, I would think, Abraham's hand is on fire the entire time. <laughs> Just, just, well, I got the fire in my hand, but that's, that's really not the case. To give you a little bit of history, it, it'd often be a clay pot that would have holes with ventilation into it so air could breathe by uh, giving oxygen to the fire, and they would keep embers, and they would keep on feeding it and often be held by a chain if they were going further away in order to uh, do a sacrifice. But he takes the fire in his hand, and if we go back to Christ... Christ has the wood on his back. And the Father is with him as he ascends the hill. But the Father, bless you, has another type of fire in his hand. God has the fire of his wrath and his anger against sinful man in his hand. The fire that he is about to unleash on his only son. He has that fire in his hand. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, And he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Friends, if you haven't been saved, you deserve this flame, this fire of God's wrath and his anger 
unless your, your sins are covered over by Christ and the sacrifice. Let's continue on. Moving on, it says he takes the knife. He takes the fire. They got the wood. They got the knife. It would have been so easy for Abraham to just, oh, whoops, forgot it. But no, he makes inventory. He remembers everything, even the smallest element, but arguably one of the most important ones, the knife. Charles Spurgeon says that doubt would have left the knife home. But faith would bring the knife. And then notice what Isaac says, right? So, so, so the wheels are beginning to turn for Isaac. And he says in verse 7, Then Isaac spoke to his father, and he said, My father! He says, Hineni, my son, here am I, my son, behold me. And it's the first time he speaks, notice that. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the offering? Now, Abraham's an old guy, right? He's been serving God for over half a century now. And he has sacrificed over and over and over again. And his son has seen him sacrifice over and over and over again. He wouldn't have just forgot. This line of questioning is pretty appropriate for the moment. He says, Dad, I, I see everything else, but hey, old man, aren't you forgetting something? Notice Abraham's response. And I like the way the King James puts it, but I hesitate to jump from translation to translation. Verse 8 says, And Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And so the two of them walked together. It's a beautiful picture that is beginning to develop with every single sentence. And this is one of the main reasons that I love God's word. And I just simply regret every moment that I spent not studying it, living apart from Christ. But man, let me just encourage you this morning, church family, study your word. And and you're one of the fortunate churches, or one of the blessed churches, I should say, that has a pastor that is willing to get into it with you. Don't take that for granted. He says, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked together. In John 1, 29, a man with long hair that would eat locusts and was the cousin of a controversial character of a radical rabbi would make a declaration there in the New Testament. As Jesus would walk close to that little lake where he was baptizing people, he would say, Behold the Lamb of God! that takes away the sin of the world. Who is that lamb? It's Christ. Verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God told him. And Abraham built an altar there. He arranged the wood and he bound his son Isaac and he laid him on top of the wood. After many steps, a heavy heart, they, they finally get to the place. And, and we're probably picturing what Abraham is going through. But think of what Isaac is going through. Uh, think, he's already said the Lord's going to provide something, but, but they're going through all the motions. And if they were to travel this far, they would probably have to dig in order to make the altar out of dirt. And then they would put the wood on top of the altar. They probably have to get stones and, to reinforce it. And Abraham's an old guy, right? He's over 100 years old. And, and Isaac's a young and clearly strong person. And yet he just submits. They came to the place which God told him. This old man has to bind his son and lay him on the altar. And I think he would have been able to get away. I think if me against a hundred-year-old dude, don't think it would be all that big of a fight, right? 
But notice that the son submits. I love that about the son. I love that about Isaac. It's beautiful. I'm sorry, I lost my place, friends. <laughs> Just give me one second. Let me find it here. Yes. Let's see here. Abraham builds this altar. And if we're going back to the, the type of Christ, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of the story of Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And many people come to, to arrest Jesus. And, and one person in particular speaks up and he, and he says, we want Jesus. And Jesus says, who, who are you looking for? And, and they said, well, we search for Jesus of Nazareth. And what does Jesus say in that moment? He says, I am he. And with those words, bam, everybody falls back on their faces. They just, just fall over. And then after they get back up and dust themselves off, they're thinking, what was that? And then Jesus asks them again, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And, and they bind him with rope. As though he hadn't just said the words that literally knocked everybody over. Like the rope would do anything. And I think if we go back to Isaac here, he probably had to help his old dad maybe configure the knots a little bit. I mean, he, the dad probably wasn't lifting the son up on this altar. But we see the willingness of Isaac and the willingness of Christ. Christ could have easily gotten out of the sacrifice that he was supposed to do. Easily. He's the son of God. But he didn't. He was submissive. And so Isaac does as well. And he has submission to the father. And notice in verse 10, it says, Abraham stretched out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. Notice the absolute submission to God. He submits to the will of God. And in spite of the Lord giving him such a difficult task, he is willing to take it all the way to the brink, and he is for certain of what is about to happen. I'm about to kill my own son. You know, in preparing for this, I thought, where else in the scriptures does God give a difficult command? I think, for instance, of the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 19. Where, where the rich young ruler says, well, what, what should I do to ha have eternal life? And Jesus says, go and sell everything that you own. And he goes away sad, right? But there was no willingness to even do that for the father. Abraham is completely willing. Can you imagine what the Lord could do through your life to serve him if you were willing to serve him? Just to be willing. Just, Lord, whatever you have me to do, I am willing to do what you want me to do. But he's about to take this knife and he's about to slay his son. And notice this is the climax. This is the brink of the story. This is where it's all about to take a really, really crazy turn and a really awkward explanation to Sarah back home. <laughs> but notice this, verse 11. But an angel of the Lord called to him, and he said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here, here I am. He nanny. Up until this point, the story has been dark and gloomy. But all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord comes. And keep in mind, when you see this, the angel of the Lord, it's talking about Christ. And he shows up. Abraham says, Hineni, here I am. And he said, do not stretch your hand out against the lad. Do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, for you have not withheld your son from me. I love what Matthew Henry says about this. He says, the things that we hold close are most likely to continue when we are most likely to resign them to God's will. We know that Abraham loved his son. 
but he loved God more. What would the Lord ask of you to put on the sacrifice from your life to him? You know, God's not asking us to sacrifice children. And and he'll never make this kind of declaration or decree or command again. But what is the Lord asking you? To put on the altar of sacrifice to him. And and this is good news when Abraham hears it. Because he's about to go through with death. But the angel of the Lord says, and he declares to him good news. And, and, and this whole time, uh, I don't know about you, but when I read this, the whole time I think, man, poor Isaac, he's just an innocent guy, right? He's just a, a young man trying to do what he thinks is right, trying to serve God, trying to follow in the footsteps after his father. And he's just going through all this. But in reality, Isaac is just as deserving as, of death because he's a sinner, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. He's sinful. He needs a substitute in this moment, but in a larger scope, he needs a greater substitute, which is Christ. He says, don't hurt him. Don't touch him. You've shown true faith. Isaac is delivered. Abraham is approved. And God knew that he had faith beforehand, but now there was some true evidence of it. He says, I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your, your son, your only son from me. And I love that wording, your son, your only son. Because a very particular verse, a very obscure verse that you're probably not familiar with comes to mind, John 3.16. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him will not die, but have eternal life. And then one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. Verse 13. Then Abraham raised his eyes and he looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And when Abraham went and took the ram, offered him up as a burnt offering in the place of his son. This is the substitution for his son. But notice, did the Lord mess up? I mean, Abraham said that he would provide a lamb, but he provides a ram. It was inventory low on, on lambs that day. I, I don't think so. Because in that moment, I don't believe, I believe Abraham was speaking about that instance in particular, but he was also speaking, looking to the future. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. And he is the ultimate sacrifice. Then we come to verse 14, but I want to read a verse from the New Testament quickly. John one twenty nine. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And verse 14 says this. Abraham called that place Jehovah Yiddi. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Bible students, This is Moses writing this down, by the way. It's in Genesis. And this is 400 years after this event happened. Yet he still puts it in future tense. The Lord will provide. Because the Lord hadn't provided yet. The Son would eventually come. Jesus, live a perfect life. Do what you and I couldn't possibly do. And he would be the ultimate sacrifice. He would be the lamb that takes all sin away. You know, when we talk about this place where they're at, it's a very special place. In Second Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, it speaks of this place. And it's where Solomon builds a temple. And it's where for thousands of years hundreds and hundreds of lambs and rams and and goats and doves would be sacrificed. All looking forward to one sacrifice. And that is Christ. 
And friends, we need the sacrifice this morning just as much as Isaac needed it all the way back then, almost 4,000 years ago. We need Christ. We need him in our lives. We need him and his sacrifice to cover our sins. And as the band comes up and it begins to just play a little bit, I want you to think about the sacrifice that is here. The sacrifice is what Christ had spoken of thousands of years before. In Ephesians, it talks about how this is the eternal purpose. And friends, it says in Ephesians 2 that we are dead in trespasses and sins. But it's God who is rich in mercy. And he provides a way for us. How do we accomplish this? Well, we can't accomplish it on our own. The Bible is very clear where salvation comes from. It's of the Lord. But he does command us to repent of our sins and to believe in Christ. If you've never come to that point in your life to where you've repented of your sins and believe in Christ, if the Lord is pulling at your heart, do that today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your graciousness and for your holiness, Father. God, I thank you for the gift of your word. God, I thank you for every opportunity that you give us to study it. God, I pray that as we hold your word in our hands and as we hide it in our hearts, Father, that we would become the new creations that you desire us to be. God, I thank you for this church. I pray that you would grow them in your grace and in your will, Father, and that they would come to love you so much more as the years go on. God, I pray for our pastor, Pastor Nick, Lord, and his family. I pray that you'd comfort them, God, in these hardships and these trials that they're going through in this very moment. I pray that you'd strengthen them and encourage them. God, I pray for all the saints and the believers here in this room, Lord, I pray that they wouldn't stop following after you and seeking you, Father. God, I thank you that you have offered us the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate lamb that is found in your son. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more.
was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is Would you uh, pray with me? Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we are so immensely blessed by you. Thank you for the rich gift of your preparing Mark for this message today for us. We thank you for the truth of beholding Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Father, there have been many that have said in the past that we need to ditch the Old Testament, and in doing so, we would completely toss the history of redemption and your grace throughout the ages, preparing your Son to be our sacrifice, our substitute, and our representative. Thank you for the Old Testament. We praise you for your word. We thank you that your word is faithful and true because you spoke it. It's just who you are. So we worship you, we praise your holy name, and we ask for your rich blessing in our fellowship as we continue our service. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, uh, what a joy it is to be back with you guys again. We've been missing you for a couple of weeks, and uh, it is so good to see your faces. Y'all can please be seated. 